Hi, my name is Adrienne Banks, and I'm an acute care nurse practitioner for West Cancer Center in Germantown, Tennessee. Today, I will be speaking about antiphospholipid syndrome. I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest in relation to this program or presentation. Here is my outline for the presentation. Antiphospholipid syndrome, or APS, is a systemic autoimmune disease characterized by arterial or venous thrombosis and or obstetrical complications in patients with persistent antiphospholipid antibodies. Antiphospholipid antibodies are among the most common causes of acquired thrombophilia. APS is unlike most of the other genetic thrombophilias, given the association with arterial thrombosis. APS can occur alone as a primary condition or as a secondary condition in the setting of an underlying disease. The most common underlying autoimmune disease is systemic lupus erythromatosis. APS can be further de described by the clinical manifestations in the setting of persistent laboratory evidence of antiphospholipid antibodies. Thrombotic APS is when the patient has confirmed venous or arterial thrombosis. The most common sites for thrombosis are the deep veins of the lower extremities and the cerebral arterial circulation. Obstetrical APS describes specific adverse pregnancy outcomes, including recurrent early miscarriages, fetal death at or beyond 10 weeks of gestation, and premature delivery due to severe preeclampsia or placental insufficiency. And catastrophic APS, which is a rare life-threatening form of APS characterized by thrombosis affecting multiple organ systems in a short period of time. Antiphospholipid antibodies are autoantibodies directed against phospholipid binding proteins. The most prominent of these proteins is beta-2 glycoprotein 1. Testing for antiphospholipid antibodies include immunoassays to detect anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 and anti-cardiolipin. Assays will include both IgG and IgM isotopes and lupus anticoagulant, which is a functional clot-based assay used to identify antiphospholipid antibodies that interfere with in vitro clotting assays and prolong phospholipid-dependent clotting times, such as the PTT. Antibodies against beta-2 glycoprotein 1 or prothrombin are the most common cause of a positive lupus anticoagulant. The bottom five autoantibodies listed on this slide are not included in laboratory criteria for APS due to poorly standardized testing assays and a lack of clinical significance. Despite significant research, one unified mechanism that explains all of the prothrombic activity of antiphospholipid antibodies has not been identified, and this may be because of the antibodies heterogeneity and or because the antibodies influence multiple different pathways. One commonly proposed pathogenic mechanism is the activation of endothelial cells, monocytes, neutrophils, and platelets, which result in expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Another mechanism frequently described is that antibodies inhibit fibrinolysis and the natural anticoagulant proteins, including protein C and S, as well as antithrombin. Lastly, antiphospholipid antibodies appear to activate complement, which ultimately results in cellular injury and death, thus promoting coagulation. Clinical scenarios that raise suspicion for antiphospholipid syndrome include unprovoked venous or, throm venous or arterial thrombosis, especially in a young patient, or clotting in unusual sites. And examples of unusual vascular sites include upper extremities, cerebral venous sinuses, and retinal, ovarian, or renal veins. Next, patients with recurrent pregnancy complications, such as fetal death after 10 weeks of gestation, multiple early pregnancy losses, 
and or premature delivery due to severe preeclampsia or placental insufficiency. Patients who have recurrent clotting despite compliance on therapeutic anticoagulation would also be concerning for APS. And lastly, patients with any of the above clinical scenarios with a known history of an underlying autoimmune condition. The clinical features of APS can vary significantly. Arterial and venous thrombosis and pregnancy-related complications are the hallmarks of the disease, but other non-criteria manifestations may include TIAs and ischemic stroke, which are the most common neurological findings, but you can also see cognitive dysfunction, seizures, and multi-infarct dementia. Mild thrombocytopenia is common in APS. Valvular heart disease is prevalent in APS, and so patients may develop valvular thickening and non-bacterial vegetations. Patients with APS are also at an increased risk of developing coronary artery disease. There are many cutaneous findings that have been attributed to APS, with levito reticularis being the most common. Levito reticularis is described as a blue or purplish lacy pattern that can be seen diffusely, but is most frequently seen in the extremities. APS can cause thrombosis in any vasculature bed, including that of the renal system, which ultimately may result in acute and or chronic renal failure, although renal involvement is most frequently seen in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. There are no defined diagnostic criteria for APS. Medical providers use a combination of clinical assessment and laboratory testing to guide diagnosis and management decisions. Not all patients who have antiphospholipid antibodies develop antiphospholipid syndrome. The antibody type, titer, and underlying comorbidities determine the likelihood of developing clinical APS. Antiphospholipid syndrome is frequently diagnosed when at least one clinical manifestation is present in the setting of persistently positive antiphospholipid antibodies. Testing must be positive on two separate occasions at least 12 weeks apart. Initial antiphospholipid antibody testing is usually performed at the time of the thrombosis or adverse obstetrical event. Although you must remember that acute thrombosis may falsely normalize the PTT and anticoagulation can affect lupus anticoagulant screening test. Therefore, patients may require repeat initial testing and careful interpretation of results. Anticardiolipin and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody immunoassays are not affected by acute thrombosis or anticoagulation. A clinically meaningful antiphospholipid profile is defined as a positive lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin IgG or IgM with a titer greater than or equal to 40 units, or an anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 IgG or IgM with a titer greater than or equal to 40 units. Again, remember that testing must be positive on two or more occasions, at least 12 weeks apart. Patients may be further classified into high, moderate, and low risk profiles, depending on which antibody is present and the severity of the titer. A persistently positive lupus anticoagulant would classify a patient as high risk, but many providers consider triple positive results to be associated with the highest risk for clinical complications. In 2023, the American College of Rheumatology and European Alliance of Associations for Rheumatology published new and highly specific APS classification criteria for research purposes, and that can be seen on this slide. APS classification criteria include entry criteria, which is at least one positive antiphospholipid antibody test within three years of an antiphospholipid antibody associated clinical event 
followed by weighted criteria, which has been clustered into six clinical and two laboratory domains. Patients accumulating at least three points from each of the laboratory and the clinical domains are classified as having APS. Patients are occasionally found to have positive antiphospholipid antibodies incidentally during diagnostic workups for conditions such as infertility or lupus. And these patients may have positive antiphospholipid antibodies, but they have not had a documented episode of APS-related thrombosis or APS-defined pregnancy morbidity. So in these cases, non-pregnant patients are generally not treated with anticoagulation or aspirin for primary thrombosis prevention. In non-pregnant patients who have suffered from a thrombotic event, with suspected or confirmed APS, anticoagulation with warfarin is preferred with a standard INR of two to three. Patients with arterial thrombosis are typically treated with warfarin with the INR of two to three plus a low dose aspirin. Patients with antiphospholipid syndrome and unprovoked thrombosis typically require indefinite anticoagulation. Evidence suggests that direct oral anticoagulants are less effective than warfarin for recurrent thrombosis prevention in patients with APS, especially in those with a history of arterial thrombosis. DOACs can be considered in some clinical situations, such as intolerance of warfarin, but there should be well-documented patient education on the possible reduced efficacy of DOACs when compared to warfarin. Recurrent thromboembolism despite adequate anticoagulation is rare, but it is possible. And if the recurrent thrombosis occurred despite compliance with warfarin and a documented INR between two and three, you could consider increasing the target INR to three to four, but there is a lack of clear evidence to support higher intensity warfarin. Transitioning to Lovenox would be another option to consider in that situation. Immunomodulatory agents are sometimes utilized. Some clinicians add hydroxychloroquine and statins to patients experiencing recurrent thrombosis despite anticoagulation. Rituxan is sometimes given for hematological manifestations of APS, but again, there is a lack of high quality data to guide clinical practice. It is important to reduce modifiable risk factors to help avoid recurrent thrombosis. And examples of risk factor reduction would include educating patient and families on anticoagulation compliance, minimizing interruptions of anticoagulation in the perioperative period, reducing venous stasis, and avoiding estrogen-containing medications. Warfarin and direct oral anticoagulants are not used during pregnancy. So pregnant patients with a history of thrombosis should be treated with therapeutic dose Lovenox plus low dose aspirin. Patients can resume warfarin after birth and warfarin is acceptable even in patients who choose to breastfeed. In pregnant patients with persistently positive antiphospholipid antibodies, but who have not had a thrombosis or APS defining pregnancy complication, low dose aspirin is recommended in the antepartum and the postpartum period. Patients who deliver vaginally should also have SCDs while in the hospital and then continue for six weeks. Patients they should continue the aspirin for six weeks. Patients who underwent cesarean delivery would should have prophylactically dosed Lovenox and low-dose aspirin for six weeks. The same treatment recommendations exist for patients with APS who have experienced one or more preterm deliveries due to severe preeclampsia or placental insufficiency. Patients with APS based on their recurrent early pregnancy loss or fetal death after 10 weeks gestation should be treated with prophylactic dose to Lovenox and low-dose aspirin in the antepartum and the postpartum period.
Catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, or CAPS, is the most severe form of APS and is characterized by widespread thrombotic disease leading to multiple system organ failure, developing in a short period of time in the presence of positive antiphospholipid antibodies. Catastrophic APS is rare, and it occurs in less than 1% of patients with APS, and it is frequently fatal with a mortality rate greater than 30% despite treatment. It is not clear what causes catastrophic APS, but it is thought to sometimes develop in response to a trigger such as trauma, surgery, infection, and has even been noted in some malignancies. Acute kidney injury is very common, with some studies showing up to 75% of patients with CAPS also experiencing renal failure. Pulmonary embolism and acute respiratory distress syndrome with pulmonary hemorrhage may be seen. Encephalopathy and strokes are common, as well as heart failure and myocardial infarction. Levito reticularis, necrosis, and digital gangrene are the most common skin manifestations of CAPS. Pertinent lab findings may include thrombocytopenia, features of hemolytic anemia, such as increased LDH, low haptoglobin, and schistocytes in the peripheral smear. Patients may also have prolonged coagulation tests and a ferritin level greater than 1,000. Catastrophic APS can be difficult to diagnose because it mimics so many other disorders, such as DIC, HIT, and TMA. Early diagnosis and aggressive treatment is the key. Classification criteria for catastrophic APS includes evidence of involvement of three or more organs or systems, development of manifestations simultaneously or in less than one week, confirmation by histopathology of small vessel occlusion, and laboratory confirmation of the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. You must meet all four criteria to be diagnosed with definite catastrophic APS. Probable APS criteria is less stringent and only requires involvement of two organs or systems with manifestations of a third event occurring between one week and one month after presentation and does not require histology confirmation or laboratory confirmation of antiphospholipid antibodies. Management of catastrophic APS typically involves a combination of anticoagulation, glucocorticoids, and therapeutic plasma exchange or intravenous immune globulin. In the absence of major bleeding, anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin is preferred in addition to low-dose aspirin. Once clinically stable, the patient can be transitioned to warfarin. Patients are also free, frequently treated with high-dose steroids, such as solumedrol 0.5 to 1 gram daily for three days, followed by a prednisone taper. Most CAPS patients are also treated with plasma exchange or IVIG, but typically not both. Other medications that may be used in refractory cases include rituximab or ecolizumab. To summarize, antiphospholipid syndrome, or APS, is a systemic autoimmune disease characterized by arterial or venous thrombosis and or obstetrical complications in patients with persistent antiphospholipid antibodies. You should suspect APS if you encounter patients with unprovoked venous or arterial thrombosis, especially in young patients, patients with one or more adverse pregnancy outcomes, patients with recurrent clotting despite adequate anticoagulation, and in patients with underlying autoimmune conditions. Testing for antiphospholipid antibodies occurs at the initial event, but must be repeated in 12 or more weeks. There is no definite diagnostic criteria, and diagnosis is based on a combination of clinical features and a persistently positive antiphospholipid antibody profile. Non-pregnant patients who have not suffered from thrombosis or APS-defining pregnancy morbidity typically are not treated with anticoagulation or aspirin for primary thrombosis prevention. Warfarin is the preferred anticoagulant in non-pregnant patients, and Lovenox is used for pregnant patients, and long-term anticoagulation is needed due to risk of recurrent thrombosis. Thank you very much.